Today's conversation is sponsored by the Billy Keels Advisory Program. If you want to learn more about how to make your nine to five optional, just go to billykeels.com forward slash advising. Once again, that's billykeels.com forward slash advising. You're listening to the Going Long Podcast, the number one podcast for the strategies, tactics, and actions high wage earners need for living an intentionally designed life of wealth and resilience. Welcome to the Going Long Podcast. We're back once again to continue to help to educate you so that you feel much more comfortable as well as confident being able to build the wealthy and resilient lifestyle that you want to lead and do that much, much faster. I'm your host, Billy Keels, and I am super excited to welcome you back to another one of our brief solo episodes. And wow, today is I'm going to get real vulnerable. I'm going to share something with you um, because it's one of these things that after failure, you can learn so, so, so much. Um, but before I do that, I want to say thank you so much to each and every one of you that continue to download the podcast. You continue to share the podcast with your family, with your friends in our community. And, and Going Long Family continues to grow, helps to keep us in the one point, the top 1.5% of podcasts globally. And I just want to say thank you so much, especially for those of you that are tagging us on LinkedIn, you're tagging us on Instagram, and you are continuing to grow the presence on, on social media. It means the world to us. And also thanks to those of you who are continuing to leave your honest written reviews as well as ratings it helps us to be able to adapt the podcast change it give you exactly what you want it means the world and if you want to leave your honest written review tell us what you like tell us what you'd like to see changed just uh there's even a nice little video here in the show notes so go check that out and then for anyone who's interested in checking out any of the previous episodes there's literally more than 420 episodes uh spanning years just go to billykeels.com forward slash podcast uh, you can check out every single uh, podcast ever, we've ever done. Uh, once again, it's billykeels.com forward slash podcast. You get the transcripts, you get the audio, the video, every single thing that you want. So, wow. Uh, you know, there are some really amazing results that can be achieved after failure and failing. And I want to share with you today, uh, like here's literally the amazing results I achieved after failing. And... I'm going to get a little bit vulnerable with you because it's a story that maybe I've shared, but, but maybe not. And, and I tend to, to, to want to share this because as someone who is a self-proclaimed recovering perfectionist, it can be really difficult when you have this plan, especially when you're your whole life you've gone through, and I'm talking about like school age, middle school, high school, college, uh, you, you, you study a lot. You then go take a test and then you get a good grade on the test or a great grade on the test, then you think it's just stop, study, get a good grade, and that's all you need to do. And when you're used to having success after success after success, because the grades keep coming back A, A plus, A, A plus, B plus, you think that that's the, what, what actually growth is because you get good grades. Well, if we go back to my summer, um, actually not, it was just before the summer, it was in, this was 1990. Five, uh, probably in early late 1994, going into 1995, um, I was a. It was my fourth year of college, and I was deciding. I had a really amazing teacher, um, Ms. Ziegler. Shouts out to you, um, who recognized that I had a gift for 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 languages. Anyway, she recommended that I have a second degree to go with the marketing degree that I had, um, and thanks to her and another gentleman named Mr. Madison. So, shouts out to Mr. Madison. Um, they helped me to to be able to go overseas. And that was in 1995. But the thing is, is like, as a kid who comes from a lower middle class family, like I had to put myself through college, right? Um, my parents always wanted me, my brother and sister to, to go to college, get the college education, because they saw that as the, the, the way to not having to work harder and more hours and more hours. And so, you know, I worked every summer. I saved up my money in the summer times. Um, I don't know if I've ever told this, but um, for those of you who are listening, who may know me from even college, like I used to clean wrestling mats and worked throughout my entire college, um, my, my college time, right? Because I needed to make the money. I needed, I needed spending money. I needed to be able to pay off the loans because I had to take out loans to go to college as well. Um, I took out a lot of debt loans. I got some scholarships as well, but I worked my backside off to be able to have money to be able to do the things that I wanted. And so, um, you know, just recently hadn't turned 21, it was time to add a second degree um, because I wanted to get this second degree because, well, I 
didn't get the dream job that I wanted and I didn't really know what to do. And so this teacher that saw that I had um, special skills was in, in for languages that I wanted to develop those languages. And also inside, like I also wanted to be um, be somebody like special, right? That's that's what I what I wanted to to do. And so when I got accepted finally to the university in Spain, it was actually in Valencia, Spain, back in 1995. I had a chance to go to Pueblo, Mexico. Uh, but I ended up that I wanted to go to Spain. I wanted to go overseas because I wanted to come back fluent in Spanish in a three months from like September to December. That was my goal. Like, I can't, I am hey, going to go over. I've saved up this money. I worked through this money. I got some scholarships and I'm going to actually go uh, and become, come back and be fluent in Spanish in three months. Right. Um, and also too, there was this desire, like I wanted to be able to show my family that I could go overseas. I could be the first member of our family to actually go to Europe, to be there, to live there. Uh, and, and I wanted to see that as a way that I could also change my life. Well, the thing is, is so I got accepted to this university. I had this big dreams and I remember the day it was in, in September, um, in se early September of 1995, took a fl flight from uh, New York's JFK, flew from there to Madrid, uh, Madrid, then into Valencia, Spain. And I remember Super vividly, because remember, I wanted to go over in the, the I, my entire life. I just I studied, I took the test, and I got really good grades. And so I set my mind to going overseas. Um, and so I was able to between the money that I worked for in the summer, some scholarship money that I had, and then that was actually going to take the test was going to Spain, and then I was going to come back with an A, of course. And so because that had been the pattern my entire life. Well, I remember getting off the bus in September of 1995 um, at 21 years old, and I was walking down the steps and all the, the host mothers were coming to meet everybody because I stayed with the host family. And I just remember, and I remember this as vividly as yesterday that when I had flown all night, I mean, I was super tired. My clothes were wrinkled. You know, I think I kind of had that, that forehead sweat when you're traveling all night overseas flights, you know, you've been there. Um, and I got off the bus a little bit tired and this woman just started speaking to me. And I remember, I thought I knew Spanish really well. And all of a sudden it's just like, <laughs> And I didn't understand anything. And I just remember my entire body inside going like cold. Fear just overtook my body. Like I had this pit in the gut, in the, in the gut of my stomach or in my stomach. And I was like, what in the world am I doing here? Like, I can't believe it. I'm so far from home. Um, I don't understand the language. I thought I did in this first event. It was just like made me scared. And so I remember like coming off the bus and I knew that I wanted to go out and I want to hang out and I wanted to meet people, but it had such a profound impact on me that I realized like, I don't want to be suffering. I'm only here for three months. And so I had a mind switch because that first thing interaction with local persons scared me, like not scared me. Like I was afraid to walk out, but like, it scared me that I wasn't able to, I wasn't going to be able to become fluent in a couple of weeks and so, or a couple of months. And so what I did is I took the easy path, right? I took the easy path to be with other Americans, to hang out and speak English all the time. And we'd go out and we'd do things together. And um, I realized that in my mind, like the thing that I said I wanted to do is come back and be fluent in Spanish, but it was going to be too much work. It was going to be too difficult. And so I didn't want to go through the pain and suffering for three months. Well, as I was hanging out with Americans the entire time. And we were speaking English the entire time. And every once in a while I would speak Spanish and I wanted to meet some people. I didn't meet local people, but I didn't actually make it a focus area. And the thing is, is that was a really easy path, but I also noticed that my Spanish wasn't moving in the direction as quickly or as fast as I wanted it to. And then fast forward to probably about two and a half months. Now I've been, you know, hanging out with Americans. We've been playing some basketball with a couple of guys that are really, really cool. Shouts out to you guys. You know who you are if you're listening. And, um, also, we would go out in the evenings, but when we went out in the evenings, it was just me with a bunch of other Americans and expats and stuff like that. And so at this like two month mark, you know, we're starting to be back in the classes and we're seeing what's happening. And I remember vividly, and I don't remember the guy's name, but there was this, this guy who he, he wore glasses. He always sat in the front row of the class. I saw him when I would walk around town and he was almost always with Spanish speaking people and he was practicing. He had his notepad with him. Uh, and I remember in class when he would read, he would be reading in Spanish and he felt very comfortable. He looked very comfortable. And I noticed that this guy was doing something different. Like he was always with local people. He was very like he was kind of an outcast with our group, but he was always with local people. And I remember 
that when the whole thing was over and it was December 1995 and I was flying back, like this guy was actually speaking Spanish. And when I remember coming over, his language, it sounded like it was pretty much at the same level as mine, but he was doing so much more work and really took the hard path to go and be with locals. And I took the easy path. And I realized like I, and in December when I was flying back, like I wasn't fluent in Spanish, but I, I kind of like, I failed myself because it was really difficult. And instead of like going head on, like this other guy, um, I kind of decided I chickened out. Like I didn't want to go through the pain and the discomfort for three months to come back and be fluent. So I failed myself. Right. And as I failed myself, I realized, you know what? I saved up too much money. I, I cleaned too many wrestling mats. Um, I took out too many loans and the people that helped me to get over to Spain, I felt the sensation of ha having failed because I did not come back fluent in Spanish. And although I was the first person to go overseas, it was one of these things where I thought, wow, this is just not what I wanted to sign up for. So fast forward a couple of years later, I get this amazing job. It's like five years, 58 countries. I was traveling around the world. I said to myself, when I left in 1995 from Spain, if I ever had the opportunity to go overseas again, that I was going to do like the guy that was wearing the glasses in the front row. And so in, I had an opportunity after five years, I took a one year sabbatical in 2001. And when I went back, I went back with this desire to do exactly what I said before. So this time I was going to be like the guy with the glasses. And when I got accepted to a university in Paris, France, um, with not knowing any other people when I moved to Paris, it was one of these things that was just kind of really wild. I said that I was going to go to Paris. This time I was going to, uh, I wanted to learn French language and culture. I wanted to learn more about wines and I wanted to learn how to salsa dance. And one of the things that I did it is it was, I got there and it was not easy because I got to a place where I didn't speak the language. I'd never taken French. So I didn't speak a word of French. And it was really hard because I didn't understand the French culture. I didn't speak the language. And this was right at two, 2001 in September. And so if you can imagine September, 2001, there was a lot of conflict going on around the world, especially international relations between the US and France, right? With this whole thing that happened in the US and these weapons of mass destruction, I won't get into that here because this is not the place, but the tensions were pretty high. So I was in this really difficult situation in a place where it wasn't like the most American friendly place at that moment in time. But I stuck to it. Every time I heard English, I went the other way. If there were events that were, um, that were French speaking only, I did those where there were places where I could learn to dance salsa, which is what I did. It was taught all in, in French. So I went there, I did that. I learned French. I learned how to salsa dance. And so I guess I've gave myself a year. And although in 2001, that one year sabbatical that I decided to take, I said that I wanted to speak French fluently. I wanted to learn more about wine and I wanted to learn how to salsa dance. Well, after a year, I didn't speak French fluently. My salsa was actually pretty good. Uh, and I did probably taste more wine than I actually learned uh, more about wine. And so even though I didn't get my to my goal in 2001, what I realized from what I'd learned from the guy in 1995 that I actually applied to my own life was that when I put my mind to it and I actually do the actions and don't worry about the fear because I was unfamiliar with Spanish in 1995 and I was unfamiliar with French language in 2001, but I wasn't afraid to do the work. I kept pushing forward. And so I realized that through this experience, I had the confidence to do the it, to achieve the goal that I set out to achieve, like inside, I realized that 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 had started to take place, that I had much more confidence. I also realized that I did, if I took away the distractions, that I could achieve whatever I wanted to be able to achieve. I started dancing salsa. I started uh, learning French language and culture. So I actually got a job in France. I started working in France. I started working in French. I started understanding more about the French culture, all the things that were happening around me and the tensions that were happening between France and the US that didn't matter anymore. And then if I continue to look forward, it's now been 23 years. I've learned four additional languages, uh, been able to live in three different countries. And so the, the scope, when I actually take that failure that happened in 1995 and applied it and turned it on its head, there's nothing that can't be done. There's nothing that you can't do if and when you break through 
uh, the fear. So these are some of the amazing results that I achieved after failing in 1995, taking the learnings from that failing or failure event and being able to put it into my life. And as a result, um, even though I didn't speak French fluently in 2001 after a year, uh, I stuck with it. And I've continued to stay in Europe and continue to build a life and continue to learn more about different languages, different cultures. Um, and, and it's been absolutely amazing. So uh, if you have faced a fear or if you are facing a fear or you've just gone through a failure or a failure event or a learning opportunity, however you want to call it, realize that there are amazing results that are waiting for you on the other side. Just push through the fear, push through the failure, get to the learning, get to the growing. Um, so. Like I said, I want to be a little bit vulnerable. I want to share a little bit of this story with you, go into a little bit more detail. I know I've talked about it in high level and other things, but um, hopefully this is helping you or someone that you know. Uh, if you know somebody who's just had a failure event and they feel like they can't move forward, share the story. Uh, feel free to do that. Um, take it, share it, talk about it. Uh, heck, reach out to me. I'd love to uh, to chat with you about it. Uh, I have ways to do that here in the, in the links in the show notes. Uh, but listen. I hope this gets to you in time. I hope this helps you. And so with that, um, while you are sharing today's episode with others and listening and, and putting it into action, I'll be here preparing for the next episode. So until then, go out and make it a great day. And thank you very much. Freedom. Today's conversation was sponsored by the Billy Keels Advisory Program. If you're looking to make your nine to five optional and need some help, just go to billykeels.com forward slash advising. Once again, that's billykeels.com forward slash advising.